The first thing we should learn when a child looks at us is they are asking, would you love me? What a child most needs to thrive is the love and nurture and belonging that a family uniquely provides. Being brought up in a children's home and being brought up in a family setup, they are two different things. Putting kids into a permanent home is a long-term solution. Put kids in a family and you give them the whole package. There is a shift now regarding orphans. There is a shift, and I believe that God is doing something new at this particular time. I always thought I would start an orphanage, but today I believe very strongly that children don't need a house, they need a family. They don't need an institution, they need a home. I hope church will wake up more and more in this subject, uh, and this dream about world without orphans or will be grow inside a Christian community. What are the best solutions for orphans and vulnerable children? Very often people from the West tend to think that, oh, let's build orphanages, let's support orphanages. And it's positive because if you look at what's happening in these countries, I mean, in the Western countries, it's been already a long time when uh, there is a clear realization that children need to be in families. So I think that's something that the church in the West somehow needs to pick up, that even although we are talking about some developing nations, some hard situations, but still we need to start with focusing on the families. The time of institution is, is past. It's super important for us to get abandoned kids into families as quickly as possible, in the states as well as in other places, that we don't need kids to be on a treadmill um, of uh, different placements, especially during those developmental years. They need to be safe, they need to be nurtured by the same people consistently, and, and that, that needs to happen urgently. Otherwise, you are creating um, the people that are going to cause the most problems for your society later on. Who are the greatest targets for human trafficking? Orphans. Um, you know, who, who, are, who are some of the people that are vulnerable to, um, you know, to the drug trade? Orphans. In my country, at 18 years old, they come out of the houses of care and they don't have anything, no family, no work, no studies. So they come back to the streets to prostitute, consume drugs. At the end of the day, um, institutions create dysfunctional, dependent people. You know, we see a lot of sociopaths and psychopaths because they've not had that attachment, they've not had the ability to build relations and attach with people, and so they form a new subculture. If there is a child that has been trafficked, most likely it means that there was no one who loved and cared for the child. If there is a child that is, you know, is involved in child labor and is, is being abused, there is no one there to love and protect that child. So if we come from this approach, then this whole concept of making sure that children grow up in loving and caring homes would, by itself, would resolve a whole lot of other issues. There's almost a signature of kids who come out of institutions. In fact, Michael Rutter, who's a very distinguished child psychiatrist, has argued that it's an institutionalization syndrome. You know, it's deficits in IQ and executive functions and ADHD and attachment problems and, and often growth stunting as well. When you look at the effects of raising kids in institutions, there are lots of factors that contribute to their outcome, but I think the critical issue is have they been placed there early, early in life, say abandoned at birth, versus did they enter the institution when they were much older, having first grown up in a family. The core problem is the child has to be in a loving and caring and stable environment. If that's not happening, then the child is vulnerable to all kinds of risks. Professor John Bowlby said in the 1950s, where there's maternal deprivation, children will develop, often develop mental illness, physical illness, and sometimes even die. And for some reason, you know, we've, um, you know, all through history raised children in families. You know, as a Christian, I believe God made the family for the child. And then for some reason, about a couple of hundred years, we start to decide to put them in warehouses and wonder why they don't do well. We have uh, uh, children's homes, we have uh, orphanages, and, and I think it, those have been created by the, I think the people who come with uh, funding and they come in and prescribe you know how you know children children should uh, be uh, taken care of but you know the model that uh, we we have been uh, using especially in the villages 
is uh, an extended family. When we prioritise a child's material needs above their emotional and social needs, it, re it relates to a, a response that we have, which is taking children out of that context of material poverty and trying to address those aspects of material poverty through orphanages and providing education and neglecting the other aspects of poverty, which is actually being empowered in your community, in your, in your family setting. So I think that really understanding what poverty is from the perspective of those communities is really critical to, to addressing some of these issues. In some parts of the world, uh, the very presence of an orphanage can create a, a pull effect upon otherwise good families where the parents see that the, the level of education or food or, or other things that they cannot adequately provide at home is provided in this residential care facility. And so they, they hand their children over unnecessarily. And in cases like that, we would really affirm that the number one responsibility of the church has to say, we will help these children thrive in their family of birth rather than creating a facility that, that draws people out of there was 1,500 orphans in that orphanage, 1,500 children. And in my travels, when I've been to so many different orphanages, I begin to see children who were abused. I began to see children who came out of orphanages. They grew up physically, but they were not secure in the Lord. Uh, they were in a place where they didn't really have that connection. And they were people who never mentored them. They were not accountable. They were in places where they didn't know how to make choices. They were left on, on, on their own. And that's where my perspective of orphanages changed. I'm not saying that there is no place for any kind of institution, but it's, uh, you're, it's always a last resort. And all our resources, all our efforts should be aimed to what we can do to either preserve children in their families, or if it's not possible, to find new loving and caring homes for them. And I know that it may look, from a Western perspective, that how can it be impossible in places like Uganda or in places like Bangladesh, when there is so much poverty and there are so few resources. But by being in many of those places and knowing some of those families, it is possible. So there should, we should change the paradigm, the way we think about some of the things. All these organizations that are working with these orphans and vulnerable children, what is, our, what is our goal? What's the win? It's for the kids to be loved, right? It's kids to have family. It's the kids to stay in their family. What is most important is that how do we provide uh, a loving home for, for the children so that they, they grow up in a, a really family uh, home environment? There are many children homes in Kenya that bring children in from the streets and from all over. But most of them, it's like kind of they are looking for, for money from different places to, to support them. But we are encouraging the people in the churches, the leaders, that's why we call them, to like encourage the members. If you have two children, you can take in another one into your home. It's not just enough to say that we don't need orphanages, especially in some places there might be still a need for some sort of an institution that would provide uh, ideally temporary care for children before they go to families. But this, I, I'm not so much worried about paradigm shift being, oh, we don't need orphanages, as this being very clear, we need families. There are so many children that we, we, we have in children's homes that we can trace their homes. So some of them will be reintegration, some of them will be adoption, some of them will be guardianship, some of them will need kinship adoption, where your brother dies and you, are, you take his children and you legally have them as your children, then take them through their lives. If you create a service that has good residential care, good international adoption, good domestic adoption, good foster care, daycare, whatever, you've got choices for children. And I think when the only option is an institution, then you'll get lots of children sitting in institutions doing this. And we know what they're asking for is that attachment and bonding that they need in a family. So um, for our point of view, we want to give that alternative and give any child that's able to, uh, including many children with disabilities, 
the chance to live in family life. We can simultaneously affirm some of the great programs that are happening to care for children in, in other ways, but ultimately work towards the goal that every child have a family, both uh, with, with their birth family, if that's at all possible, and if not, with another family that truly embraces them. It's rare in, in Africa that you would find someone without an extended family. That's, that's, um, that's, that, it, that doesn't happen in Africa. You always have an extended family. It's estimated that globally there are more than 150 million children that are classified as orphans. Um, but, but that includes children who've lost one or both parents. And so for the large majority of these children, they, they have a surviving parent. And, and many others have relatives or others who are willing to provide a, a quality home. But, but often they require significant support and strengthening. And of course, the Bible so often pairs widows and orphans in the same section. And when, and when we see that, that, the role of the church is to help that widow and orphan orphan or perhaps a widow or an orphan to, to thrive as a family. We call that family preservation. When it comes to orphans, many think, oh, we just need to have more international adoptions. If you could just adopt more children out of, of Belarus or out of Kyrgyzstan or out of India, that would help. Well, I'm not saying that international adoptions are not helping. There are many kids that, you know, basically they've got a new life by being adopted uh, to different countries. But if you look at the big picture, this is just a very small portion of those children that need help. So the solution is truly within the country. So, so the question that Western Church should be asked, so how we can come alongside the national church and how we can come alongside the local leaders and, and enable them or empower them and just work together with them so that there will be a developed solution within that country. Let's say, for example, that domestic adoptions will be happening, that people will be adopting children in their own country or foster care will develop. Or well, there will be solutions to uh, prevent children from being abandoned and being abused and so on. In the case of kids who have lost their parents, for example, or you couldn't prevent abandonment, I think what we need to do is develop a, a way to get them into, ideally, a permanent placement immediately. And if not that, a transition from high quality foster care into a permanent placement. But we shouldn't be thinking of foster care at all as a long-term solution to this problem. Uh, putting kids into a permanent home is a long-term solution. Familias. Necesitamos familias. Eh, tenemos los dos programas, con familias de cuido y con instituciones. Y los chicos que salen de familia tienen muchas más oportunidades. Eh, los cuidan, se los dejan hasta después de los 18. Eh, les ayudan a salir adelante. Son como mentores eh, que los aconsejan, los guían. Eh, les ayudan a superar sus traumas a diferencia de una institución que por más amor y cuidado no hay, eh, sigue siendo un tema colectivo y no individual, entonces no es tan fácil sacarlos adelante. In India, the, one of the initiatives me and my wife are taking in is to challenge many more couples uh, to adopt children, and even if they don't adopt children, we are challenging them to foster children. So we envision in the next 10 years to set up 100 family units uh, across India, is what our vision is. And uh, our, our family has become a role model um, where people are coming in and spending time with us to be trained. In all our projects in China, there's one support worker for 20 families. And so we're training those people to support 20 families in the community. And those families can say, hey, we're going, you know, we've got an issue. And there's someone there to come out and help. There's no fairy tale. <laughs> it's hard. It's great. It's awesome. We love how God has brought our children into our family and we love our children deeply. But we can't deny that it's messy. Um, adoption comes because there's brokenness. And ultimately when you step into adoption you have to realize that at some point as a family all of you are going to have to deal with that brokenness. We have found that kids placed in institutions in, as babies, if they're removed and placed into foster care, high quality foster care, before they're say 18 to 24 months, they have better outcomes than the kids who are placed after that age in many domains. Our reflex is to always give, say, the biological parents as many chances as possible. This is when they're not orphans, this is when they're abandoned, say, or, or maltreated. And I think we're going to have to face the hard dilemma of rethinking that. You need to change the laws that insist that one or two or three years have to be spent searching for the biological parents, for example, 
before the kid can be adopted. In the experience that we have had, especially with adolescents, who did not have hope that they see their 14, 15 years old so close to get out and with so few things to get out of the way, but they already have to go. So, I think in the last few years, we have been dedicated to looking for families de adopción para estos adolescentes. Hemos logrado ubicar nueve adolescentes en un año. Eh, eso es realmente un logro porque adolescentes casi nadie adopta. Y hemos visto el cambio. Hemos visto a estos jóvenes florecer, eh, sus ojos, la estatura, la manera de comunicarse con los demás. La pregunta que debemos es ¿cómo debemos proveer permanencia para los niños? So through, it may be through adoption, it might be through foster care, it might be through relatives, through guardians. So there are different ways, but uh, the question should be, what's going, again, what's going to happen when child will turn 16 or 18? What's going to happen when they will be getting married and having their old children? Who will be the family they can go back to and, you know, and call their you know, dad and mom? And it's not to, not to be dependent on them, but I think there is a, something that not all of us think about, that we need parents, not just when we are children. You know, we, we need parents as long as uh, you know, they, are alive, they are alive. One of the struggles that my wife has, even now, we have been married for 17 years, but she was in the orphanage center where she had food, she had medical uh, treatments, she had school, she had everything that she needed in the orphanage center. But at the end of the day, even now, she's struggling with one thing, identity. She's like, who is my uh, model? Who, who can I call a mother? Who, who, who is my daddy? She's teaching herself to be a mother because no one has, told, has ever told her to be a mother. And no one has ever told her that you can be a great mother. Yeah. So that's one of the challenges when our children are in the orphanages. It's a girl that was adopted two weeks before she turned 18, you know, and there is, everyone would say there is no chance that there can be a permanent forever family for this girl, and she had it two weeks before she turned 18. And now she's married, she has children, she has a child, but she has also parents, and she can always call and she can visit, and that's something that she never had before in her life. This is so, so important point. And my message for all church around the world, please, don't afraid. Adopt children. Take them. Give them best present around the world. Uh, father and mother, good family. This is the real best present for children. The institution that God has set up in the world better than any other with the most caring and compassionate people in the world is called the church. And that's the group that needs to be recruited first to be able to come in and help with this crisis of orphan care around the world. I hope church will wake up more and more in this subject uh, and this dream about world without orphans will be grow inside a Christian community. In Costa Rica, there are around 1,500 children in orphanages. So, and we are around 6,000 churches, local churches. So, if, if uh, each church in Costa Rica um, uh, would be involved in helping in this, you know. So, can you imagine? Uh, Costa Rica would have a problem with all these children because we will be part of the solution. In the state of Colorado, many churches have chosen to make a special focus of caring for kids in the foster system in a lot of different ways, fostering and adopting and, and mentoring. But, but we've seen the number of children in the state waiting to be adopted go from more than 800 five years ago to, to around 300 today. And, and everyone knows who's doing it. I talk with state social workers. They say it's, it's the churches. They're taking the kids that no one else used to want. And, and what a privilege, what a beautiful thing if we were to see the church around the world known in that same way, saying they are the ones who are taking kids that maybe no one else used to want and embracing them and loving them as adoptive parents, as foster parents, as mentors, and in other ways as well. The church here can stand out, can stand up, and can stand out to do the work of the ministry here. 
Uh, not all can be able to foster, but even a church can be able to support. Like the program that we have in Uganda, we have some programs that like, let us support the families that have taken in children. I have a dream, real dream, uh, about America, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa without orphans. I have real dream about world without orphans. And I have one easy point. If we have so many church around the world, if, uh, if one church find one, two, three family who will adopt one children, we will have big, amazing result. No offense around the world. It's a recognition that church has to play the key part in this, and we cannot outsource this to the government or to NGOs. I think that's, that's, uh, that's something that has to be established. And I'm not saying that church will do everything. We need government to do a lot of things, and we need NGOs. But if you are talking about, if you are looking at orphanhood not only as a social issue but as a spiritual challenge, then uh, that's how it helps us to see that only church can truly provide the solution to this. I do have deep hope that over time the church can reawaken to, to the, the beauty of what, what is seen when, when the church is caring for orphans in their distress, when the church becomes that father or mother as a community to children in various ways. Sometimes that's preserving existing families. Sometimes that's fostering. Sometimes it's mentoring. Sometimes it's adopting. It's all those things. But, but when the church reawakens to that, indeed, it will be a beautiful day. We also need to work in solutions to see that children aren't orphaned and to see that, um, that families are able to remain intact and to see that, um, to see that the church is active um, in, in being able to, um, to minister to people before they enter into crisis. And so it, it's not an easy solution. I think the paradigm in orphan care has shifted a great deal, um, but I think that there's still a missing piece. I think things like When Helping Hurts have stopped or slowed down. I would say it's slowed down, debilitating partnerships. But I think the thing that's happened is that people now are doing less of the bad thing, but they're afraid to do anything. And so they want to listen to local people, but they don't know how. They want to give money, money wisely, but they don't know how. They want to visit people and encourage them, but they don't know how. We need to learn to work together, you know. And that's part of the idea that we are the body of Christ. Uh, um, but we need to, to grow in this. We are fostering 10 children. And I will not mention any names or anything, but this is one organization that told me, bring in 50 children today, and we will sponsor you just like that. We'll get you sponsorship. But 10 children, you know, the American people may not be excited about it. Yeah. So, and I had to tell this person, I said, I'm more worried about the quality. You know, I don't mind there are people bringing 40, 50 children and doing it. But I am called to just bring 10 children. If you have good pictures, if you have numbers and stories, that's all the American church needs. And there's funding coming in. And if we can solve the partnership crisis, we can solve the orphan crisis. The church network's there. We have resources together as people and relationships and wealth, that the network's there, the people are there, the willingness is there, and we just need to partner differently to let God's love spread in unimaginable ways. The best thing we can do is, first of all, to empower the pastors. Because when a pastor is empowered, the, the following after him is backing him, will back him up, um, I think, 100%. We have a little statistics already through this past three years. Uh, if we speak to 500 people, in a year period, we see about 20 families, new 20 adoptive or foster care families. If everyone waited to get another room, to get another car, to get another ABCD, to get another money, to get another budget, to get another thing to be approved, then nothing will be done. Sometimes we just have to move by faith and by the leading of the Lord. The best way to recruit is by word of mouth. All the research in the world tell me, if you want to recruit families, you can put, a, you can put billion dollar programs in place, but the best way is word of mouth. 
if you've, if you've fostered a child and you've had a great experience, you're going to tell your family, you're going to tell your sisters, your aunties, your uncles. Russia can become a country without orphans. If we think of numbers, we see that there is 1,000 adults for just one orphan waiting for a family in our society. So what is it is, like social problem, or legislative problem, or it's just consciousness problem, you know? So what happened to us? We are trying to popularize adoption in the Kenyan culture so that the Kenyan community can adopt children and now if our church do it and another church do the same and another church do the same, then Uganda can be of of any free in just five years. If we are going to have a world without orphans, which I think it's possible if all the kids are you know placed in their extended family um, members' homes, we will have a world without an orphans and we empower the families in order to take care uh, of, the, of, of the children. You know, there's nothing wrong with these children uh, that are in, orphan, uh, in orphanages. There's something wrong with us. <laughs> you know, we really realize that uh, Russia, Russian society has all the potential. We have all the resources, you know, to solve this problem. Something inside of us just stops it on this way. We must change our mind. We must change something inside our heart. We must say, I will serve for God. I will adopt children. This is Bible message. God called his people out, God called Israel out to care for orphans and, and widows and sojourners and the poor and there was a consistent message that he gave to his people and he's continued to give to his people that we see evidenced all the way to, to, you know, to James. And, and that is, I want you to care for the vulnerable when all the nations around you and all the peoples around you are victimizing the vulnerable. I want you to care for the vulnerable. And the reason I want you to do it is because that's who I am. Because I'm the father to the fatherless and I'm the defender of the defenseless. For God the Father who tells us that he won't leave us as orphans, but he'll come for us. It's a picture of the gospel. And that's why orphan care is so important. It is a beautiful, perfect metaphor for what God has done for us. When Christians are loving orphans, whether that's through adoption or fostering or mentoring or your countless other ways, preserving struggling families. The church looks like Jesus. It looks like the heart of a father who loved himself and pursued us and adopted us as his children. And Jesus said, whoever uh, welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one that sent me. Pero sobre todo sentirme a veces incapaz de ayudar. Eh, sobre todo a veces mm, lo que más me duele es a veces no saber cómo ayudar <coughs> para que ellos aprovechen la oportunidad porque muchos no saben cómo y se escapan o, o vuelven a la calle y eso me duele. Me duele no saber cómo eh, hacerlos sentir dignos de recibir amor. Perdón. <risa> <coughs> ¿Cómo enseñarles a ser dignos de recibir? Porque ellos creen que no se lo merecen y eso me duele. Me duele no saber enseñarles el amor de Dios a veces. Eh, como yo quisiera que lo aprendan y que lo sientan. When we feel like we can't do it, when we feel like we're inadequate, when we feel like we have nothing con to contribute, I think, particularly as Christians, that's when God celebrates and says, like, I've been waiting for you to realize that. Like, you can't do this. This is for me to do. This vision for a world without orphan, it sounds like it's huge, it's grandiose, and, and surely I cannot do anything to help. 
but the fact is that every person can do something, and, and everything matters here, even one prayer matters, and just helping financially a family that is adopting child matters, you know, organizing Orphan Sunday in your church matters, so there is a place for everyone, and only a small percentage of us actually needs to adopt, and honestly, there are not even as many children that need to be adopted. In the U.S., there are many more churches that children that need to be adopted. In Ukraine, there are as many churches as children that need to be adopted. And it's, it's often the case in many countries around the world. So the problem is big, but if you take a good look at this, it's solvable. This is all about one child. When we, when we think of Russia without orphans, Ukraine without orphans, world without orphans, oh my God, it's all about one child. So we um, encourage people to concentrate on one, one child's life. You know, it's not about all the children in the world. It's not about statistics. It's not about millions and billions. It's like this particular child, his life, what you're going to do with this? And when we think of the world, let's think of the world of this particular child. 